Anytime you're putting yourself out there, you're doing so to an audience. Even if that audience is just one person, you're still using your power of choice. You're picking your audience, your timing, your environment, your delivery method. It's all in your control, or at least most of it is. <laughs> There's some of it that isn't. Today we get to talk with Nicole Holland, who I know through the podcast scene. She has a couple podcasts herself, Business Building Rockstars and Get Guest Ready. And her main squeeze is hooking podcasters up with really killer podcast guests, some of whom have already appeared on our show. They're awesome, aren't they? So we talk a little bit about that today, but mainly we're talking about why it is so gosh darn important to set up a velvet rope around your customer experience and why you need to put your own oxygen mask on first before putting yourself out there and crashing and burning hard. This conversation applies to artists, business owners alike. So even if the businessy talk is a bit strange because sometimes us business owners can sometimes go into a full vocabulary bubble that doesn't always make sense to non-businessy folks, <laughs> I'm urging you to stick this one out because it applies to you, even if you don't own a business. So if what Nicole is saying sounds intriguing and you want to get to know more about her, go ahead and check out the show notes for this episode. They're always at barenakedbravery.com. Go ahead and just search Nicole Holland when you get there to get all the links to her various projects and podcasts and other goodies. And that I give you Nicole Holland. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery, from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today, because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Nicole, are you ready for some bare naked bravery? I am so ready. Awesome. Nicole, you are a podcast guest expert because that's what you do. That's just what you do as, a, as for a living. First of all, can you tell me a little bit about how you got into all of this? Absolutely. Because it's a pretty niche niche. It is a niche niche. And I love that you pronounce it niche niche and not niche niche. Niche, um, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a podcast myself at time of recording. We're literally exactly one week shy of my one year anniversary. Yay. Yay. And before I started podcasting, I was interviewing experts on summits or a summit, I should say. One summit I did, 30 experts. And from that, one of my experts, his name is John Lee Dumas. He was interviewed by me about podcasting as a marketing strategy and what he had to say made sense. I decided to take his advice. I decided to start a podcast. And in that podcast, it's interview based. And I started noticing that even though somebody was highly successful and had accomplished a lot in their life and was making millions or whatever it was, and that they had done a lot of interviews, did not necessarily mean they were going to be a good guest. For me. And I started noticing like what was kind of getting on my nerves and how people were showing up and what I did not like. 
And I think I really noticed that because I had some people who were showing up where I was like, oh my God gosh, I love you. And it was such a good interview. And my audience was responding. And so I really started paying attention to that gap between what was really good and what was really bad. And I started noticing that you couldn't just know if somebody was highly accomplished that they would be good or bad. And you couldn't know if it was somebody's first interview. I had a few people who it was their first ever interview and they blew it out of the park. And so I started going, hmm, okay, I think this is something that makes a good guest. And then I would go out as a guest myself and basically be the guinea pig. And I would try things out. And then I was like, okay, well, if I do this, I bet that I will be able to get more of the listeners to follow up with me, to connect with me, to take action with me. And so as I tested things and I proved or disproved my theories, I took note And I started teaching it and I started telling my great guests, the one I just loved, you know, I'd have people on. I'm like, oh, that was so much fun. And you need to get your message out in a bigger way. I want to help you. Can I introduce you to people? And so that's really kind of how this all evolved. I was just making a lot of connections. I was helping a lot of people just because I was so excited and passionate about this and improving the overall platform, I guess, of podcasting. Because as a listener, I don't want to be listening to a show with a bad guest. Like I've, I've heard so many shows that actually are really good shows and the host is great and everything's very consistent, but every once in a while, they'll get a guest on there where it's like, I can't even listen to this and I turn it off. And it's not necessarily that the, that the guest doesn't have good content or isn't a good person. They're just not a good guest. And so I think the more you listen, the more you realize what you like, what you don't like. So I was teaching this to people just as it would come up and giving a lot of my guests tips for how to improve their sound quality or how to improve their offer or whatever it was. And then I was getting a lot of podcasters saying who I was introducing to great guests and they would say, you need, oh, I know, actually, I'm stepping ahead of myself. I started writing it down. I was like, one day, I was going to just make a lead magnet, like just a free ebook, but I couldn't stop writing. Literally 12 hours, I went nonstop writing. And so we decided, well, that's going to be an actual book. So I started writing this book on how to be a great guest that podcast hosts can't wait to interview and listeners can't wait to learn more from. And then that's when podcast, my podcaster friends were like, no, no, you need to teach this. Like if you come up with a program for this, I will be sending people your way because I get cold pitched all the time. And some people I actually am interested in, but then I find out that they're just not good guests. And I would love to be an affiliate for you. If you're going to teach this, I'm going to put it on my website. People can pay you. I get a kickback. Then once they're finished, I know they're going to be a good guest and I'll interview them. So I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense, but where's the time to create a program? But after enough pushing, I said, all right, I made a beta program in the summer and that was the summer of 2016, tested my theories, tested that people actually would pay me for this information. And yeah, and then I was going to relaunch it as a proper full program and something was stopping me. And then all of a sudden I realized I don't want to sell information. I don't like it when people don't take action. I'm a results oriented person and I only want to take money from people who are going to have great transformation with me. And so what I decided to do February 4th of 2017 was create a free podcast where I give all my top tips away and a free course. So then when people are paying me, they are paying me for the connections, for the transformation after they're showing me and demonstrating that they are putting into practice the principles that I'm teaching them. Mm -hmm. So I just rambled on for a very long time. (laughs) And I hope that was uh, not overwhelming. No, no, that's great. I I was just, I was like, I have my points that my questions that I want to dive into now. It's, um, it's so fresh, Emily. You know, like we are recording on March 14th and this was literally just over a month ago that I had that clarity. And then I launched 
February 21st. So from the clarity on February 4th to the actual launch was 17 days to create a podcast and a course, which is insane. And I wanted everything. It's pretty insane. It's pretty insane. And I wanted everything to be done and like up and perfect. And of course that didn't happen. So here we are March 14th. I'm still working on the lessons. I'm still working on getting the episodes done because as we all know, as creative entrepreneurs, that put way too many things on our plate and have way too many irons in the fire. It's like, okay, wait, this has to take my attention right now. This has to take. So hopefully by the time your audience is listening to this, Get Guest Ready and Get Guest Ready School will be completely out there and ready to be consumed. So I have a question about what it was like to carve out a place for yourself. I don't know that I actually did carve out a place for myself and I'm still struggling with articulating what makes me different because I get that question a lot. Why should I hire you and not this other company that's been around longer? And what I'm finding myself saying is you shouldn't. Don't hire me. Go with them. Because I think what's happening is rather than trying to carve out a space is I'm just embracing myself, my message, and my quirks more and more. And the more I do that, the more the right people are coming to me and they're already sold before. I mean, like I just enrolled a new client yesterday, in fact, and she had already come to me. She had scheduled a discovery call for the end of last week and we just finalized the contract yesterday. But when she came to that discovery call, like she was like, all right, I just need to know, like, how does this work in terms of payment and, and contract and da, da, da. And so it was just a formality. And prior to that, I was attracting a lot of people who had questions about me having to prove why or sell why they should hire me. And what I've realized is, and, and maybe this is what you mean by carve out, I have a very unique way of doing things. And I have a very... I'm not everybody's cup of tea and I'm not the popular cup of tea by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't want to work with most people. I only want to work with people who I flipping love, like who I want to sit and have coffee or tea with, who I could talk for hours with and have a glass of wine. That's the direction that I've been working on moving my life to. And that's and I would, all I and want And I would clients. add that that right there is the bravery that I see in you and yeah. that, that right there. And I think that's something that we as business owners, creative entrepreneurs, artists, even just people who are in relationships with other people, <laughs> we're always asking ourselves, how is it that I want to show up in the world? And the trick with being brave is, oh, I don't need to figure out the, the how necessarily. I just need to figure out how to be me, how to be myself and how to show up as myself. Um, For sure. And I love that you said, you know, that obviously you, you attract the creative entrepreneur and the artist. And Mm -hmm. I think that essentially I am an artist and throughout most of my life, I said I was not because I couldn't carve something or I couldn't mold something. I can't paint an apple that looks like an apple to save my life. But I am a creator. I am a creative and I am an artist. And what I see with artists that I've dealt with who play the role of the struggling artist, whether that's with a physical art or musician or whatever, they're so overly concerned and consumed by doing a commission and selling out like, okay, well, I can get a lot of money, but then I'm not really doing me. And the truth is it doesn't have to be that way. You have to be willing to step into that unknown. And there's been a lot of time where I'm like, there ain't no money coming in and I'm getting pretty scared. But as soon as I recognize that I'm getting scared, I take a nice deep breath and I go, I'm not getting scared because if I'm getting scared, I'm going to start taking that commission that's not the right fit or taking on that client that is going to drain me and that I'm not going to ever be able to really please and take away from all the clients who are going to love me. And so once I take that breath and realization, I go, 
I don't need that commission. I don't need the money because as long as I am going to do me, do me well, do me a hundred percent, my people are going to find me and they are going to like beg me to take the money from them. Oh yeah. And that same, that same thing applies to as a musician who's trying to book venues that applies to getting dates (laughs) that applies to even, even the specifics of putting yourself out there in terms of like PR press and everything. So the, this is a subject that is very, very integral to the concepts of bravery that we talk about. So let me ask you a question about this because your business model is very unique. Like there are a lot of people who put basically for those of you who aren't business owners, there's this thing called a paywall. And when you put a paywall in front of your whole business, that's like saying you must have a key before you can enter in the shop. Another example of a paywall is like when you go into a boutique, you get to see and touch and try on all of the goods, but you can't walk out of the store until you've paid for your goods. Another example of a paywall is, well, let's use Nicole because Nicole's got one where she's basically saying, have my advice, take my advice, do it. Then the paywall is if you want me to help you even further. And that is, that's pretty unique, and at least in terms of the kind of work that you do, because there are a lot of other agencies and groups and businesses out there that basically work as a concierge service or a matchmaking service for businesses like publicists, you know, all of this kind of stuff. So why is it that you set your business model up so uniquely? Well, it's definitely been an evolution And I'm big on give something before asking for something. And so even when I started my online business, which was the Business Building Rockstar Summit, that's how I launched it. It came out of my frustration of being marketed to, saying yes, paying for a service or a product, getting it, and then not getting the results that I believed I was going to get from the marketing. I was very disappointed with a lot of what I was seeing and I found out that I was not alone. And so what I endeavored to do with the Business Building Rockstar Summit was to create an online conference where the people who I invited to present and to who I interviewed, it was all actionable content. It was all give me in 30 minutes to 60 minutes everything you can to let somebody really try on this strategy. Give us a level of competency from, you know, starting from nothing. Let's get a little bit of competency to where people can test it out and see, does this feel right for me? If it does, then the natural next step is going to be they want to hire you because you provided them that experience, that transformation, that going from having no idea to feeling like, okay, this is something I want to do, but I need more. So really, I mean, naturally that was my style anyhow, but the way what I'm doing now has evolved. It's taken a few twists. And in this very short time, I was looking at what are other people doing? And then I looked at what I don't like about what other people are doing. And then I looked at, okay, well, I'm going to do it my way, but I still need to, you know, deal. I I mean, you tried to make an appointment with me. I actually, I think we may, I may have canceled on you. I wound up having to cancel about 20 appointments at one point in February. And I had to like rebook things because I was so incredibly overwhelmed. And I was getting so many people who were like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. She's great. Which is a good problem to have, right? A lot of people are really resonating with my message, but I was very, very available saying, oh yeah, we can have a talk. We can have a talk. And I was completely exhausted and I wasn't getting my stuff done because I was answering questions and I was working on convincing people. And then at the end of the day, most of the people I was talking to I was not going to be able to make them happy anyhow, and they were not going to make me happy because all I was going to have to do would be work going uphill to try and make them happy. 
So I got clear on that. I want to help these people, but I don't want to interact with them, if you will. Like I want to give them value, but I only want them to get to that next step with me if they've already done the work, Mm -hmm. if they've already tried what I'm saying and they have had that experience that, oh yes, this works. And not just latch on to me because I was, you know, named one of 50 must follow women entrepreneurs in 2017 or latch on to me because I'm friends with Dory Clark or because of anything that they perceive to be as, oh, well, she's mm-hmm. someone worth listening to because. No, first, listen to me, then take action on what I say, have that experience that it actually works for you, then let's talk. Then I'm happy well, to take your money. It's very similar to, so when I was teaching, I still have it. I still do this. But when I was teaching full-time cello lessons, I had a, I still have, like I said, still have a quite a lengthy application for someone to even OMG, ask. OMG, you have a lengthy application to get on as a guest on your show, woman. <laughs> it's true. It's true because- yeah. Because I value my audience and I value my own time. And I also, as a music teacher, I valued my other music students. And I wanted to make sure that if I accepted a new student on, that I was saying yes to the right people and saying no to the right people as well. And I didn't want to waste anyone's time in the process. So it's very important to me and to you and your, the work that you do, that you're that you're providing a kind of quality and a kind of connection that really, that really is what you're in it for. And one Um, of the things that I say too, is even though the client is the one who's paying me, the one who wants to be a guest on other people's shows, it's really, I mean, I will refund a client and say goodbye before I will chance damaging a relationship with a host So it's really the hosts that I'm building those deep relationships with so that when I call you up and I say, hey, Emily, I've got this guest. I think that's going to be a right fit for you. You've had the experience with me by then to say, okay, I believe you because you've already proven to me that you care about me. You care about my audience. You care about matchmaking and not just giving me, you know, somebody's one sheet. And and that's what, unfortunately, most and not all, but most of the people in this industry do. Mm -hmm. Most publicists are most booking people. Like, it's really just about the numbers. And I'm not a salesperson. I never have been. And I'm a relationship person. And so for me, the relationship matters more than anything. And I try and get that across to my clients too, Mm -hmm. so that when they go on a podcast, and this is what I teach in my podcast, Get Guest Ready, and in the school that's free now, and it's not paid. This is what I really teach, is that you need to care about the relationship more than your agenda. And if you're going in with an agenda, you are going to lose the host, you're going to lose the audience, and then what's it all for? Whereas if you go in and you just connect and you just be there in service and of service, you don't know what could happen. Who knows what kind of opportunities could come? And at the very worst, then you have an enjoyable conversation for 30 to 60 minutes, you know, the very worst. The first Bare Naked Bravery Challenge was in May of this year, and it was a total success and I cannot stress how inspiring it is to dive into a pool of you brave people with a bunch of other folks doing exactly the same thing and I want to make sure that you're signed up for the next five-day bare naked bravery challenge that is if you're up for it so what happens is individually each challenger picks a specific area of life business creativity relationships whatever an area that you know you need to be brave in then going one step further, picking a specific tangible task for that week. So this could be finally getting around to doing your taxes. It could be knowing that you have some difficult conversations coming up. It could be even as as simple as doing a different kind of exercise that week just to mix things up and experience something different. It could be getting back online and going on a date. Whatever you choose, big or small, as a group, 
with all the other challengers, we go through some of the basics of bravery together. And each of these five days will have a really simple assignment aimed at exploring and building bravery in your chosen area. So what you'll find is that doing these little mini baby steps individually and at the same time as other folks, these baby steps are so easy and you end up wanting to take bigger steps than you, you think you might, I promise. And by the end of the week, you'll have a much better understanding of how you can be brave and apply this bravery in a really tangible way to the rest of your life too. So participation in the challenge is free, completely free. However, I wanna be sure that you get in on the list before you miss the next challenge, which is coming up soon. So just go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash challenge. Again, that's barenakedbravery.com forward slash challenge, and you can sign up and you'll get prompted to do all the next steps. And I will see you guys in there. As a musician or an artist who is putting themselves out there with booking agents or gallery owners or venues, you can do the same thing in this in your own unique industry. If you're a, t a school teacher, you can go about being a school teacher in your own unique way because I can tell you from experience that there are people, there are students, there are clients, there are fellow colleagues who will see you doing something different and say, oh my gosh, what a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Thank God somebody's doing this differently, you know, or we had recently had Bradford Loomis, who's a singer songwriter on the show. And he also goes about doing his tours in a somewhat unique way, which I love and will probably copy for myself. But I think it's, it's really important that we go about, that we have the <laughs> integrity to ourselves and the commitment to ourselves to really go for and attract people for our businesses that match, right? And one of the best way, one of the, oh, here, I'll say this. One of the best things that I have done, and I wrote an article recently on Medium about this, is to write a list of all of your favorite clients or your favorite students that you've ever had. And when you start to see the list of favorites, or even if you start to see a list of absolutely not my favorites, you start to see these common threads of, oh, wow, this person was stuck in a cubicle and they decided to finally let themselves take cello lessons and we basically just unleashed an entire creative firestorm unbeknownst to us, you know, or this student is still taking lessons and I enjoy working with them because we send each other gifts and memes in between the weeks and in the lessons. Like I just enjoy the people that I work with. Same thing, clients and everything. And I'm imagining the same thing goes for you too. Like you like working with your people because you like your people. I love my people. And like one of the, per one of the things that my VIP clients get is 24 seven access to me. And I mean, in the contract, there's a limit. It's like, okay, you can get up to an hour of, you know, coaching and stuff a week because if, if, you know, I, I can't imagine anybody taking advantage. I did have somebody take advantage before when I was accepting people who were not a right fit. Now it's like, I'm very, it's like an application process. You're just because you want to pay me doesn't mean that you're going to get to. It's it's an opportunity for you to get to work with me. And so my clients have the permission to ping me 24/7. I actually listen to their to their interviews. I give them feedback on that. And if they have a question about something that's even not necessarily podcast related, you know, that's fine. And mm -hmm. it's nice to also be able to celebrate their successes and absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned before about artists and it's, it's something I just, I feel like I still like feel like I want to say Go for it. it's, it's almost like, I don't know if what I can't think of the word right now. Shopping galleries, is it? Or when you're pitching your to have a show mm -hmm. or to be shown at a gallery and you're going around and it's like okay, I hope this I hope I hope this one says yes. Or okay, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna show and see what they say and take the critique. And it's like it's it's hard. Whereas wouldn't you rather just be like, all right, I'm gonna go attract 
some gallery owners, right? And so these are the ones I'm going to do my due diligence. And I'm going to say, these are the ones that I think would be a blast to party with or to hang out with. And so I'm going to connect with them, get them interested in me before I even go in. And then when, when they are, and I can show my stuff, then it's like, I want them to be so excited so that when I go in there, I don't even have to work for it. Like they're positioning me. This is what I teach my Mm -hmm. my clients and my students, it's like, you want to get on the right podcasts. And that doesn't mean that necessarily the right podcast is the podcast whose audience fits into a subject, topic, whatever. It's that you have a connection with that host where the host enjoys you and they're going to position you, and you're going to position them, and you're going to have a good time because the host of a podcast, you, Emily, are like your people love you. They trust you. They feel like they know you. They don't know who the hell I am. And so if you don't respect me, if you don't connect with me, if you don't see me as somebody of value, then they're not going to at all. And that's what a lot of people don't get. They're focused on what they want as in numbers. I want to get on all these shows. I want to get on this show, get on that show. Rather than saying, I would rather get on a show with less of an audience, but a tighter audience, but has a, a host who just can't get enough of me. That's who you want. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want, whether it is as a teacher or as an entrepreneur or as an artist. Or again, as somebody who's out in the dating field, you know. Yes. I'm single. I'm single. So this is on the brain right now. I'm single as of yesterday. So I'm right there with you, sister. Oh, I don't know whether to congratulate you or to commiserate with you. You, Well, it's, it kind of comes up on this topic. So I was really into him and it was kind of a weird start and it just started not very long ago, but yesterday he did something. He said something that was so clearly like, I'm dumb. Like you clearly don't respect me. And there's absolutely no reason or excuse that this would ever be appropriate. And it was like, in an instant, I was done. I'm like, all right. And I had that thought where it's the same thing. It's like, when you know your worth, you know what you want, and you don't get it, it's like, it's so easy to just be like, I'm cutting the cord. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you, if you're not that clear and you're not that sure, and you're not that confident in your own value, then it's easy to get stuck in a relationship or in a job or in a client relationship that's toxic and you just stay in that place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, back to your, back to your point of positioning yourself within a situation for the, for the gallery owner to want you or for the booking agent to come out to you instead of you to come to them, it still works with the dating stuff too. Like if you know that you want to date somebody who loves Game of Thrones and has a kind of nerdy bent to him, then maybe you should hang out at some of the (laughs) Comic-Cons rather than some of the fraternity bars around town, you know? So if you want something, go be in those places, go be that. And the people that you want to be around will naturally come to you. And that sounds super like law of attraction-y, but it's, it is, it's, but it's so stinking <laughs> true though. <laughs> Cause law of attraction is true. <laughs> so I would encourage you guys, if you are, getting at it, getting something out of this, I would encourage you to make a list of for whatever you're talking about, dating career, pitching yourself to media outlets or putting yourself out there in a new form or capacity with whatever, make a list of things that you really want and things that you really don't want. And even if those are really polar opposites, like I would really want someone with nostrils and two earlobes or something like that versus I want someone, you know, who, who I'm, I can't come up with a list because now I'm, now I'm stuck now, on now you're so far. nostrils I and want earlobes. I does not have a nose. Right, exactly. <laughs> Whatever. So even if your list of wants are pretty vague and your list of don't wants are pretty vague, the more you add on to that list, the gray will shrink. 
the gray in the middle will shrink. And I think it'll be a lot easier for you to identify where your clients are or where your the guys that you want to date are or where the girls you want to date are or where how you can access some of those outlets or press opportunities. I think that that's a really good takeaway. So let's do this. I would love to hear a little bit about how it was for you to recognize that you were overwhelmed and choose to do something about it. Which time? I know, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, really, like as an entrepreneur, without that safety net, without that, uh, you know, stability, you are your... You are in complete control of your situation, but when we get busy, we forget Mm -hmm. that we are in control and we start putting other people's priorities before ours. Happens to me all the time because I'm a people pleaser Mm -hmm. and I'm also a results person and I'm also a go-getter and I at times don't know when to stop up here, but I know when to stop and I point it to my head. I forget that this is audio because Emily and I are looking at each other. (laughs) In my head, I know where my limits are, but I push my limits a lot just to get this one more thing done, just to get this thing done. And I get to a point where if I'm feeling like I can't concentrate or I start getting bitchy or frustrated, I'm like, oh, 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 uh -uh, uh uh-uh. We need to take a break. We need to take a breath. And usually, it just depends on where I'm at. But sometimes just that awareness and then just standing up and like shaking it off, I can, you know, just change my space and then come back to the desk and get more centered and clear. Sometimes it means shutting things down for the rest of the day. Sometimes it means for a few days. And that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur is that even though we can put ourselves into those tizzies, we can also take ourselves out. And will people be upset if I cancel appointments? Perhaps, but I can't control that. I can't control how people react to my actions. I can only control my actions. And when I don't take actions aligned with my best interest, that's when I'm not even able to show up fully and completely for anybody else because I'm not showing up for myself. So one of my coaches today told me, you look exhausted. And I thought, well, crap, you know, I feel like so much better than I did last week. And he's like, Nicole, you need to take a break. And I'm like, all right, I accept your feedback. And, and, and I feel like compared to where I was a week ago, I'm way more calm. But I also recognize that I could be more calm than this. And I also recognize that there are things that need to get done. And so, for example, like I said, get guest ready and get guest ready school. I had made the timelines far too ambitious and they're not done. And so it was really hard for me to let go of that and say, I am not going to get this done in the time frame I want it done. It's just not going to be done. And there are going to be people who are disappointed and Do I want to disappoint the people? Absolutely not. And there are going to be people that are disappointed. And I don't want to, but there are going to be people that are disappointed. And it's just that loop and say, and the more I say that to myself, the more I go, okay. And I look at the list and it's like, I haven't really, even though I launched the podcast, meaning I made it live and school live on the 21st of February. And yes, I have promoted it to an extent on my podcast. I'm talking about it here. I've talked about it. I haven't done like a big event or, you know, anything that's like really pushing it out. So there's not that many people in school right now. There's only like 42 people in Get Guest Ready School. And yes, those are 42 people I really care about and I want to give them an excellent experience. But I also, every time I say that I don't want to let them down, but I got to take care of myself. And, you know, there's nothing I can do to, if I don't take care of myself, I'm not going to get other things done. It's the whole the more I've remind myself oxygen of, mask situation. Yeah, oxygen exactly. So the more I remind myself of that, the more I can also see into the future that in this short period of time, there are 42 people that have said, I value her so much that I'm going to take this course. 
for free, but that's, you know, and I've had, I, I looked last night, I think, but not today, but it was like something like 650 downloads so far of this new podcast. So it's like, there are maybe six, well, for all the different episodes, you know, let's say there's a hundred people listening to my show and maybe 40 people who enrolled in my school. I value them all very much, but I would rather work out the kinks right now, take care of myself now, get it all done and then promote it because I don't want to let thousands of people down when I get to that point. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally does because inevitably what ends up happening is the further you go down burnout highway, the bigger the crash is True. when you when you inevitably crash and burn. Which is why it's so important to figure out who your heck yeses are and who your fuck no's are because that's not like if you're saying yes to your no's and yeah. no to your yeses, you're you're in a really bad place and that's where the burnout ends up happening. So if you can get crystal clear on who the yeses and who the no's are, then, then I think it's also worth noting. I mean, something that my friends who are concerned about me when they're concerned, you know, they'll say, we don't want you to burn out. And I'm like, I know. And I don't want to burn out either. And because I don't want to burn out and I'm not willing to burn out, and I'm, I'm fairly self-aware, so I'll get to points, and as long as I can take those pauses and assess the situation and be willing to say, well, it's not what I wanted, but I'm going to have to cancel some appointments, or I'm going to have to let go of this piece of this thing that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. Because I'm willing to do that, I think that's how I escape burnout. And I have pushed myself a number of times to get very close but I think that awareness is what keeps me from getting there because mm -hmm. I don't have any interest in getting there. I don't want to push myself so far that I'm going to like need a break. I push myself to a point knowing what the outcome is on the other side, preparing myself for it and being willing to sacrifice short term for the mm -hmm. long term goal, but also very aware that if I over go, if I go over then I'm going to be no good and I'm not going to ever get to the goal mm -hmm. yeah oh this has been such a good conversation Yay. Oh, I loved it <laughs> this is like my jam I love talking about this kind of stuff because I think like the the client onboarding like to really defining what you want is part of a huge it's part of the um, when I'm talking about bravery, there's imagination, vulnerability, and improvisation. And the imagination is like your vision of possibility. The vulnerability is acknowledging where your constraints are and where some friction is and what the actual realities of time are. And then the improvisation aspect is the, wow, well, based on these constraints and based on what I want, how am I going to move forward? How am I going to say yes? And who am I going to say yes and no to? So this is all very much in the vein of bravery. So woo, woo. thank you so much for joining us today. For sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Your brave takeaway from today's show is to make that list of things you really want and a separate list of things you really don't want. <laughs> you can do this with your artwork, your career, your relationships, your business, whatever it is. I want you to do this so that it's easier for you to see what or who is a total, hands down, absolute heck yes, and who is an absolute hell no. <laughs> it's a really helpful exercise to come back to over and over and over again. It's one I do a lot. So we would love to hear all about your favorite parts of today's Bare Naked Bravery. You can find Nicole Holland and myself on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all of that. And the links for all that is in the show notes. So if you're curious about more of Nicole Holland and all the things that she is up to, all of the links for that is in the show notes for this episode. Again, go to barenakedbravery.com and search Nicole Holland and she and her purple hair will pop right up. <laughs> if you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as she and I enjoyed making it for you, then please give us a review and rate the show in your iTunes desktop app or on your podcast app on your phone. It really, really, really does help us out a lot more than it is a hassle for you. 
So it would be appreciated a lot. Every time we get a new review, it always makes my day. Not only that, but it always makes it more visible for other people to find the show and find the bravery that you heard today and in the other episodes that we record. You are a part of that. You definitely are. So if you are digging the music in today's episode, that is because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique soundtracks. To find out more about all the artists and musicians and other sponsors of the show, please visit barenakedbravery.com and all that stuff will be there for you. I am so looking forward to being with you later on in the week. Keep your ears peeled and your eyes to the ground. Wait, reverse that. (laughs) Because we've got some really awesome stuff coming for you. So until then, I have one message for you. It is this. Be yourself. Be vulnerable. Be imaginative. Be improvisational. And be brave. Because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. 